Blatty. Welcome to today's program on doing business in Korea with James Kim, the CEO of AmCham Korea and Craig Lesser, former Georgia Commissioner of Economic Development. This program is brought to you by the Consulate General of Korea in the Southeastern United States. I want to give a special welcome to our board member, Rohit Verma, the CEO of Crawford and Company, and to Patrick Ryan, who's the president of the World Affairs Council of Tennessee. Before we begin, I want to ask all of you to please submit questions for Mr. Kim via the question function on the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So it says um, more, click on more, and you'll see chat, and you'll see questions. Use the question function, please, not the chat. It's a lot easier for me. Make your questions short. Uh, before we proceed any further, I want to introduce the Consul General of Korea in the Southeastern United States, Mr. Young Jun Kim. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador. Do I start? Uh, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Chairman Kim, uh, Ambassador Shafir, and uh, Mr. Crow Lesser, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar. This webinar is a, the sequel to the session that Korean Consulate in Atlanta and the World of Heroes Council of Atlanta co-hosted last week, uh, last month, where we discussed about the US-South Korean alliance might rule during the next uh, US administrations. Today, we are going to talk about uh, another pillar of uh, bilateral relations, uh, Korea-US economic cooperation. While the Korea-US alliance is open viewed through a security lens, it is also built on a strong economic ties. The United States is the second largest export destination for the Republic of Korea, as well as its third largest import origin. Our two countries also have a lobbyist free trade agreement known as the Coros FTA. The Coros FTA, uh, of which I was personally involved in the ratification process in Korea, entered into force in 2012 during the first Obama administration. Since then, our bilateral trade in goods has steadily increased, reaching $134 billion in uh, 2019, up nearly $34 billion from uh, 2011. The agreement also helped to support by, uh, foreign direct investment between two countries. Compared to uh, 2011, uh, Korean investment in the United States had uh, more than tripled to 61 billion US dollars as of last year. As such, uh, economic cooperation has become a core pillar of Korea-US relations. A US President-elect Joe Biden in his press conference affirmed his new administration would seek to take the lead in setting rules for trade in the Asian Pacific region and beyond. President-elect Biden's trade policy is expected to mark a shift from President Trump's uh, American first policy to more rule-based multilateral approach. The Korean economy, with the export is representing around 40% of its GDP, will be closely affected by the shift to the trade issues that the incoming US administration would adopt. President-elect Biden also looks toward global issues such as green technology to address climate changes, which is also vital to Seoul as the Korean government has recently launched a Green New Deal and vowed to go carbon neutral by the year 2050. Overall, it is critical for Korean and the US business persons to understand the coming window of opportunities to advance our mutual economic benefits during the next four years. In this sense, today's webinar is really important and meaningful in terms of timing and topic. As always, today's event has been made possible through close collaboration between Korean Council and the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. As always, my deepest appreciation goes to Ambassador Shapiro and his team for their hard work. I would also like to express my sincerest gratitude to Chairman James Kim from Korea and my dear friends, uh, Mr. Craig Ress, who will be sharing valuable uh, knowledge, experience, 
and insight today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Consul General. That was lovely. And thanks for the nice comments about the World Affairs Council. I appreciate that. Uh, James Kim is the chairman and CEO of AmCham Korea, the American Chamber of Commerce in Korea. Prior to taking up this position at AmCham, Mr. Kim served as the chairman, CEO, and president of GM Korea. Before that, he was CEO of Microsoft Korea. He earned his Bachelor of Arts from UCLA and his MBA from Harvard. Uh, he is reportedly a fabulous tennis player. Um, and Mr. Kim is joining us from Seoul, where it is 11 p.m. Korea Standard Time. Craig Lesser is the founder and managing partner of the Pendleton Group, which provides consulting services to governments and businesses. Craig is well known to the members of the World Affairs Council. He was Georgia's Commissioner of Economic Development from 2004 to 2007. During that period, Craig and his team at the Georgia Department of Economic Development helped bring more than $8 billion in new investment to Georgia, including the Kia Motors Assembly Plant in West Point, Georgia. Craig is going to be the moderator today, and I'm glad to let him do that since he knows Korea so well. Craig, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Shapiro. Council General, a great honor to be with you as well today, and as well to be with you, Jim, uh, all the way uh, from Seoul uh, to Atlanta. What a great combination, and a combination that has worked so well for so many people over these years. Uh, resulting in a great relationship between uh, between our state and the southeast and 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 the great country of the republic of korea so it's an honor to be with all of you today and before we get into the the topic itself of of doing business in korea i i'm always curious to hear perspective on what i call and what others have called the the korean miracle and that is this economic miracle that has occurred since since the, the the early 1950s where the korean economy has become one of the most dynamic fruitful incredible economies of the world and yet surrounded uh, by water and an enemy and with no real major natural resources jim what is it about the korean people that are so incredible when it comes to creating a dynamic economy. First and foremost, uh, you know, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm a US citizen, uh, although I was born in Korea, I came back here 16 years ago to, to run the Yahoo business here in South Korea. And I think after having worked here, I have a much better appreciation for why the Koreans have been so successful. And I talk about it because I ran businesses here. And when I look at uh, the employees, number one, they're obviously really, really educated here, highly educated. Practically everyone has a, has a college degree uh, and focus a lot about learning. Uh, the work ethic, these guys are constantly working. So as the head of some of these companies, it's been very easy for me to have the team execute the plan that we have. And because work is their number one priority, it makes it a lot more easy to get things done. In fact, uh, you mentioned I play a lot of tennis. Uh, in most countries, you cannot get tennis lessons at 6 a.m. In Korea, tennis courts are open at 6 a.m. with tennis coaches teaching lessons at that early in the morning, even in the wintertime. So it kind of shows you that the Koreans really work hard and they're focused on survival. And as a result, Korea is where we are. It would have what, close to a $31,000, $32,000 a year you know, GDP per capita. So that's something that is really proof in the pudding. It is really remarkable. Mm -hmm. So the topic of the day, doing business in Korea, you know, the major companies, some of whom you represented, um, you know, they, they know how to do business in different countries. Korean culture is different from American culture. The, the legal system is different. The political sure. system is different. The language certainly is different. What do you say, Jim, in your role 
at, 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 at uh, the Korea MCham to smaller American entrepreneurs and business people who don't have the wherewithal of the major corporate entities. How do you, how do you start? What's the best kind of thing to be thinking about in doing business in Korea? Well, obviously an organization like AmCham is quite helpful because our, you know, our mission is really threefold. One is to help U.S. companies already operate in Korea. And second is to help SMEs enter South Korea. And obviously when you've never really done business in Korea, it's not, it's not that easy. Obviously you talked about language, you talked about different ways of, of doing businesses, talking about relationships. In a place like Korea, it's really one degree of separation as opposed to six in the U.S. So if you have the right relationships here, you can really expedite how fast you can grow your business here. And that's the reason why we recently did a big announcement with uh, the Department of Commerce where we launched the America Business Center. In Korea, uh, we only have 20,000 U.S. companies doing business here. I'm talking about SMEs, whereas there are 300,000 doing business overseas. So I think for the SMEs, what a fabulous way to come in and take a big part of the opportunity here. And obviously AmCham, the U.S. Embassy, and the Department of Commerce, uh, we're all here to help. So we sometimes take some of, some of us that work in, in the sector, take some of this for granted sometimes when particularly entrepreneurs, small business people, they're just working hard seven days a week, don't have the wherewithal. Where do they start? Do they call you? Do they call the, the, the consulate? Do they call the, the uh, Department of Commerce? What, what do you suggest? Well, I would suggest number one is you can contact us uh, we have a website that has uh, a lot of information about what we do, but the U.S. Embassy is also a very strong partner. They have their own program that we are really in partnership with. So between the combination of AmCham and the U.S. Embassy, we feel that we can help any SME that want to begin an operation in South Korea. Plus, let's not forget the Korean government would really welcome U.S. investment in South Korea, too. So we can really have a win-win-win partnership between uh, the U.S. business community, the Korean government, and also organizations like AmCham and the U.S. Embassy. That's what we're here to do. And certainly the, the consulate uh, here in Atlanta is of sort of the most effective in supporting uh, those kinds of relationships. What are some of the sectors right now, Jim, that you think are really obvious for American business to be looking at and looking into in, in Korea? Well, I think you should know that Koreans are a highly sophisticated consumer base. Uh, and with IT you know, becoming a leading uh, you know, part of the whole economy, even with COVID today, I think we have seen that IT companies are doing really, really well. And Korea has such an amazing, uh, you know, infrastructure for things like 5G. This is a natural place for those kind of companies from the U.S. to come in and partner with big companies like Samsung and LG and the Hyundai's of the world. In fact, many SMEs come to Korea because they want to have that partnership with these huge companies. And obviously, Hyundai, Kia, they have a huge presence in the, the Georgia area. So it makes sense for a lot of uh, the SMEs from, you know, from, from Georgia to play a role in South Korea. In the so medical device. To, yeah, that's great. You'll have to forgive me. I think we have some background noise coming on my end because some of our local entrepreneurs are working in the yards. Mm. So uh, <laughs> forgive us for that. And I'll, I'll turn my mic off when I'm, I'm not speaking to you. So you have these these sectors of IT obviously is very, talk a little bit more though about the, the consumer area in, in Korea. I mean, you, you have uh, the pretty strong GDP that you've referenced earlier. Uh, people have money to spend. Uh, the Korean economy is doing very well in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, as we were talking about a moment earlier before we went on, uh, you don't have the kind of spikes that we're having here. So what are some of those things that some 
particularly Georgian, Southeastern uh, uh, entrepreneurs might be thinking about in terms of products to sell to the Korean consumer? Well, first and foremost, if you want to sell to the Korean consumer, I think you have to really understand that the consumer here, they're really, really picky. Uh, you know, when I ran the GM business here, just delivering a car to the consumer was very, very tricky because the customer would go through the entire vehicle to make sure there were no dings, nothing, you know, has any issues with the car. So just that alone, you really, really have to be savvy. Second is the speed of delivery. The reason why companies like McDonald's in South Korea are doing really well, they have over 400 stores or restaurants, is because of two things. One is uh, the delivery platform in Korea. They can order McDonald's food and get it delivered very, very easily. And also drive-through technology in Korea. Those are the kind of the things that, uh, that have helped them succeed. E-commerce, right? Even companies like uh, Costco, uh, their business is doing really well because of e-commerce. Cosmetic companies, again, they're doing well too because the Korean consumer, they're obviously buying a lot of cosmetics and a lot of healthcare related products. So for the people from, from Georgia, those are the kind of opportunities that, that I think you can partner with large successful Korean companies or enter on your own. And if you had that right niche product, you can be very, very successful. So I know we can't generalize because all people are different. Of course. Everybody's an individual. So I come over to Korea for the first time. I've got some help from, from your organization. I've got a heads up about, you know, grossly how to do business. What's important for me to know in my first introduction to a Korean business person? What's important to know about the cultural aspect? Well, you know, from a cultural aspect, I think number one, uh, establishing your credibility is very important because I think that, you know, when you first come to Korea, the reason why some foreigners have a tough time here is because things are done a little differently. I talked about the one degree of separation. I talked about, I'm gonna talk about how 65% of the Korean population live in this one Seoul metropolitan arena. So everyone is here. Uh, there are certainly you know, three or four top schools where so many people graduated from. Uh, they talk about family. What family do you belong to? Uh, talked about education again. So I think those are kind of important to at least understand. So when you come to Korea, at least you know the context. It does not mean that you have to be part of that group to, to be successful. But I think establishing your credibility is very important. Uh, having some sort of a niche where they need you is very important. And once you do, you're gonna be very successful. I'll give you one example. There's a, a e-commerce company here called Coupon. They're now the third largest employer in South Korea. When the founder started this company, what, maybe eight, nine years ago? This company didn't even, did not even exist. That now they employ the, th the third largest number of employees in South Korea. And this was a startup. So it goes to show you that in Korea, you can accelerate uh, and grow your business probably faster than many of, the, many of the other countries that I've ever had a chance to, to see and watch. And what about the legal system. I mean, when, when a, an American entrepreneur comes over and meets with you and your staff, mm. what are some of the things you tell them as it relates to the legal system and the politics of Korea? Um, what do they need to know? Well, there's, there's basically one thing they need to know. Unlike in the U.S. where, you know, the, the company and the CEO are classified differently. In Korea, the CEO is responsible personally for anything they can, they can go wrong with the company. For example, uh, if I'm running XYZ company today and there were some real bad ends in one of the subsidiaries or somewhere in, in, in a different part of South Korea, I am personally responsible and legally responsible for what happens. 
and I could go to jail. That's, I think, the most important aspect for anyone who is a CEO. And I think a lot of uh, foreigners, they don't understand it when they set up uh, an organization in Korea. And I think that's accountability too, right? Whereas in the U.S., I think that if you're not personally the one who are doing something wrong, uh, the company is really responsible. But in Korea, the CEO is personally liable and responsible. I want to remind our participants today that in a few moments, we'll take your questions. So sure. make sure you submit your questions and we can get to them in about 10 minutes or so. Jim, what about the Korean-American uh, trade agreement? How effective has that been? And maybe even expand a little bit more given the last few years, with all due respect to all of our government leaders, the last couple of years during this administration has been, how shall we say, a little bit different than previous years in terms of the relationship with uh, between the Korean president and the American president. Where are things today and where do you think things are going to go? Well, obviously we completed the, the second amendment, of course, and of course has always been known as the gold standard of the FTA, regardless of some opinions from, from different leaders. Uh, as someone who's been involved with CORUS, uh, we look at it as a, as a very important platform because it allows uh, companies uh, to use it to really handle and take care of some issues they come up. Without the CORUS FTA, I don't think that companies that have issues could, uh, you know, could really effectively fight the battle with, with the country of Korea and vice versa. At least there are standards that are in place because of CORUS. We use it to, to help our member companies. Is it picture perfect? Probably not. Is any you know, agreements perfect? Never. But I think the, the CORUS trade agreement is very, very helpful for, for the companies that we represent today, including autos. Sorry, I had you on. I was on mm. mute. How, how, let's talk politics for just a moment because it is important. It's, it's the context in which we live. Um, this has been a little bit different with the uh, Trump relationship with North Korea, which um, made a lot of noise, but obviously didn't make a lot of substantive progress. Um, what, what, what's the sense among the Korean leaders today about America, about the direction of our relationship, which has been so fundamentally strong over these years. Well, I just want to remind you and the audience that AmpShem is strictly a, a non-political, non-partisan organization. Uh, we are committed uh, very, very seriously in working with both governments regardless of uh, you know, who is in charge. Uh, as you know, you know, the US and Korea has had a rock solid relationship for over 75 years. And because it involves not just commercial, but also cultural and military, uh, we feel that it's a very, very powerful relationship. And uh, obviously with uh, you know, the President-elect Biden, uh, I met him you know, years back uh, when we had an event with him. Uh, I was fortunate to have met uh, with President Trump twice when he came to Korea. Uh, and we feel that uh, as an AMCHAM, we can work with any uh, elected official to help advance the cause of the different uh, you know, organizations that are here in South Korea. But obviously North Korea is gonna be interesting to see uh, what moves that are made. China, uh, I always talk about China because Korea is right in the middle. But I always tell everybody, uh, with China being the largest uh, partner to South Korea as a trading partner, where 30% of all exports go to China, I always worry about uh, diversification. Mm -hmm. If I'm selling anything as a CEO, I'm not sure I want 30% of my business going to one customer. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about. And third is the US troop presence. Uh, you know, still the U.S. and Korea have not reached an agreement on cost sharing on the military side. So that's something that, uh, that we're all mindful of. 
But regardless, I remain very confident that Korea and U.S. will be the two most important you know, countries as partners. I was reminded uh, by one of Consul General Kim's uh, predecessors that the strongest, the strongest military relationship in any incursion, in any opportunity the United States has had around the world, the strongest relationship has been with Korea yeah. over these years. And that is something that we very much appreciate. Mm. Let's talk about our local situation. Uh, Georgia has really had a relationship with Korea for many, many years, even preceding uh, the Kia investment as the Department of Economic Development on behalf of the state of Georgia has always had someone representing us in, in Korea and was really the beginning of that relationship, which has blossomed since 2005 and six with the Kia investment, resulting in thousands upon thousands of jobs with additional uh, suppliers, et cetera. But it is also reflected in the fact that the Korean population in Georgia has just boomed over the years. What kind of a role does that play in the in a business relationship? Uh, you mentioned the you know the family ties and the and the, and the, and getting to know each other. How important is it that we have such a large population in in Georgia? Well, you know, obviously the investments that companies like Kia and Hyundai have made is really substantial to your state. I believe Hanwha, another big Korean company is in, in, in Georgia as well. And look at the schools. In fact, you know, I, I really lived in two cities in the US, mm -hmm. Los Angeles and New York. And I spent a couple of years in Boston for, for school. Uh, I didn't really have anybody uh, who went to school in Atlanta. But guess what? So many Koreans are going to Emory. <laughs> there are so many Korean students going to all the top schools in, in Atlanta today or in Georgia, right? So it just makes Georgia and South Korea that much closer and that much more friendly with families going back and forth. And when that happens, it's going to propel more investments because maybe their kids are going to school in Georgia, right? So maybe they have some reason for that. Relationships happen. So I think that that dynamic is really powerful. You know, every year when I used to work at Microsoft, we had a big, uh, you know, convention in, in Atlanta. So I remember going to Atlanta a lot, a lot of Koreans there, great Korean restaurants too, in that Korea town. So I, I think you guys are in, in great shape. You know, it's pretty incredible if I might just suggest to you for a moment, the town of West Point, where Kia is located, mm. uh, was pretty well um, fading away around the year 2005. And now um, it's not only thriving the downtown area as a result of Kia's investment, uh, but you mentioned the restaurants. There are some yeah. really good Korean yeah. restaurants in West Point, Georgia. Yeah. Who would have thought that? So yeah. while we're taking a moment on the on the, you've referenced culture a few times, which is so important in terms of relationships. I have to tell you, Jim, we started getting questions in from our, from our, our viewers, and at least two or three of them are about K-pop. <laughs> tell us about K-pop, and is there an economic impact associated with K-pop? It, it's something that my daughters talk to me about but I don't know an awful lot about it. <laughs> you know, obviously, if, uh, if you live in uh, Korea, you know, K-pop becomes something that so many people, you know, talk about. In fact, I, I see, for example, BTS or Blackpink. These guys are on some of the biggest shows in, in the United States. Uh, so it's really a shocker. Even Blackpink was on, there's a special program on Netflix that profiled what they did. And I think when K-pop becomes very successful, it transcends into other arenas. Could be the cosmetics business. Now there's something called K-art. Korean art is also gonna be pretty strong. Also K-cuisine, right? Uh, I think kimchi has become kind of more commonized now than ever before. So even Korean cuisine is gonna be very popular. So I think that it just makes the Korean brand that much more exciting. Uh, 
remember many, many years ago, Korea was known as a cheap brand, right? Mm -hmm. People thought it was just inexpensive, cheap, and they bought it because it was inexpensive. Now, those days are gone. They look at Korean products as high quality, right? And people are paying up for quality. So those are some of the, I think, good transformation that even K-pop has really helped transcend all the Korean uh, products out there. Well, I think the point you make so vividly is that all of these relationships, no matter what they are, have ripple effects that do have a positive impact on, yes. on trade and commerce and the end result, which is so important to all of us in Korea and here in the States is job growth and investment yeah. and creating opportunities for people. So Jennifer Tipping, one of our viewers today, and we thank you for being online with us, is asking what is the largest online sales platform for consumers? For instance, Korea's amazon.com. What's the primary search engine? Is it Korea's Google? Well, it's a company called Naver. Uh, Naver probably has a market share of around 65 to 70% in search. Uh, so they are the Google of South Korea. Uh, I know them quite well because they were a very big you know, partner of ours at Yahoo years back. And the reason why they have done a very good job against Google is they have a search mechanism uh, that made it very, very uh, customizable for the South Korean consumer. It was called Knowledge Search. So it really made it a much easier and a better search, uh, you, know, uh, you know, tool for the Korean consumer. And quite frankly, they're gonna, they're doing really well. They also own a company called Lime, which is a company that is, uh, they went public in Japan. So they also have a strong e-commerce platform. But the company Coupon that I mentioned, they are the Amazon of Korea. Uh, third largest, uh, you know, employee base in South Korea and continue to grow. Uh, so these are two examples where one is a, you know, Korea born company called Naver. Uh, Coupon is a company that a Korean American came in to Korea, started it and has just uh, really hit it out of the park. What's the, we talk about all the opportunities that there are for trade and for commerce, and you've, you've really helped us understand the assistance that we can get for doing business in, in Korea and how to do it. Within the Korean economy, what's the biggest challenge right now? Obviously, we're all dealing with the pandemic, but Jim, what, what else is going on in the Korean economy that concerns you that we should be watching carefully? Well, uh... There are several things that there's a lot of concern on, and one is uh, the escalation of some of the, the tax rates in South Korea. Uh, so they are getting higher. Uh, and we just had a tax uh, seminar for foreign, foreigners living in South Korea. Uh, as a U.S. citizen, uh, obviously I pay global taxes. Uh, but now, I don't pay anything to the U.S. government because I get I, I pay all the taxes in South Korea. So that kind of shows you that now there's a, a difference in the, in the occasion. Uh, things are getting expensive here in South Korea as well. Uh, for the normal person here, apartments are very, very expensive. Housing prices has gone up a lot. So that's a big concern. Uh, and third is just some of the noise in the system, right, we talked about. Uh, whether it's China, US, uh, we talked about uh, some of the uncertainty involving the US military presence here in South Korea. That's another one that's, that has some, you know, you know some, some concern. Uh, other things is really the labor inflexibility. In fact, when you talk to most companies today, uh, in Korea, it's very hard to terminate employees once you're a permanent employee. It's not like the U.S. where you're co called an employee at will. In Korea, there is that concept does not exist. Uh, very difficult. So large manufacturing companies, they can't just, you know, reduce labor that easily. So those are some of the things that have always been a concern in South Korea. Are 
the reference here to unions, is that something that American investors really need to be concerned about at the front end? Well, it depends on what kind of companies you're talking about, but I can tell you that the union activity has really increased in South Korea. Many of the IT companies uh, have labor unions in place today, uh, whereas maybe 10 years ago, they were not present. And it's not typical to see major IT companies in the world to have labor unions in their shop. But in Korea, they're there. Uh, I know that when I was at GM, uh, we had uh, labor negotiations with the union every year. And it takes a lot of time and energy. And I know that some of the management is talking about, hey, can we do two years or three year negotiations? So those are all the things that, you know, have some concerns uh, associated with management here in the U.S. I think, Jim, that some Americans have thought, at least historically, that some of the larger corporate entities in Korea have really run things from a business perspective that made it difficult for anybody to really enter into the market. Is that true today? Well, you know, you obviously have really huge players, right? From Samsung, LG, the Hyundai's of the world and the Kia's of the world. Uh, Yeah, I think there's some truth to that. They're really, really big players. But this is where I think the Korean government is doing doing a very good job right now. I think they want to put a level playing field as much as possible. So I know when we have certain US companies being faced with some of those concerns. And I'm talking about some of the big IT companies that we're all aware of. I don't have to name who they are, but they get some heat in South Korea. No different than the heat that some of the big Korean companies get. So I think there is some consistency and that's what the Korean government is doing. And they also want to protect the SMEs too, right? And it's a start that they have to do. In fact, one thing I learned is that In the U.S., most of the wealth is created by entrepreneurs. In Korea, it's still inheritance. It's a big percentage difference. And I think that's what the Korean government is trying to to change uh, philosophically and with some help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions are coming in now from lots of folks. And Jim, I want to go to those. Quantum on Light asks, how do Koreans balance environmental concerns with their economic development? As, as consumers? You know, I think that uh, President Moon is now really, really aggressive in speaking about the, the new Green Deal. And in a country like Korea, when leaders take a, a position like that, I think you're, you're seeing a lot of the, the consumers and the citizens follow their leadership. So I think we're gonna see a lot of that. Uh, the recycling that the Korean consumers do here is pretty astronomical, by the way. In fact, even for me, it's so hard to find even a trash can outside, right? Because of the importance of recycling. And those are just really interesting examples. Uh, I see that everywhere with different consumers here, wherever they go. Ashley Aguilar asks, I've heard that the job competition in Korea is intense. How common is it to see foreigners working in local or U.S. companies? Well, it's, it's absolutely a correct statement. And as, as I said before, uh, the Korean uh, you know, workforce, they're highly, highly educated. Uh, so the competition is really, really stiff. Uh, they also are very brand conscious, too. They all want to work for the, the, the best companies in South Korea, whether it's you know, the big ones, right? But guess what, with SMEs, there's a lot of job availability. I talked to a lot of CEOs that are SMEs and they're saying, hey, Jim, I can't find good talent. They all wanna wait, they wanna all go to school and work for the big companies. And I think this is where, you know, there's an opportunity for those people who wanna work in a a small, medium enterprise, make their mark and make that company really successful. But those who have a specific niche, I think you can still get a job in, you know, in some of the big companies too, but you obviously have to have a niche. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Dan Usher asks, to what extent do Koreans prefer Korean products versus purely foreign products? And how should US companies think about 
localizing their products in South Korea? You know, when you take a look at uh, the smartphone market in South Korea, uh, you know, you know, I don't have all the specific numbers on hand, but my understanding is that Apple, who is one of the global leaders today, they have relatively a small market share in South Korea because of Samsung, right? And Samsung is constantly innovating. Uh, they have a great product. Uh, and as a result, they're winning here in South Korea. But then again, I'm seeing a lot of people who are converting to Apple. Uh, those diehard Apple, you know, consumers are continuing to, to, to buy a lot of Apple products too. So I don't think there is a, I don't think a Korean consumer is saying, you know, I'm a Korean, so I'm going to buy Korean. I don't think that really exists anymore. A consumer is going to buy because it's best for them, it works for them, and it satisfies them. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. Mm -hmm. That, I think, may be a universal uh, language. Um, Paul Pass asks, how does AmCham work with Kotra, the Korean trade promotion agency, to create business opportunities in both countries? You know, uh, we think Kotra is a, is a phenomenal organization. Uh, in fact, we just had a very large seminar called Doing Business in USA. And it was uh, co-sponsored by Kita. And Kotra is part of that whole organization. Uh, we have that seminar every year. Uh, even this year, because of COVID, we still had over 300 people in attendance. Last year, it was close to 600, and this was a virtual event combination with offline. Uh, that goes to show you that we partner with them all the time. Kotra has many offices throughout uh, the world. I, I know they have uh, you know, many offices there uh, in the U.S., so I highly recommend people here to please go visit your folks there. In fact, you know, we work very closely with uh, the foreign business ombudsman, what he is, is a uh, great gentleman. Um, he's the problem solver for us. He sometimes comes to our board meetings. And whenever we have a US company that has a problem with anything, we go to him and he solves the battle for us or tries to solve the battle for us. And his, you know, his name is Mr. Kim Sung Jin. I know the consul general probably knows him, but great man. Well, that's great information. This, is, this has really been helpful in understanding the basic concept that, that we started with, how to do business in, mm. in Korea. So uh, Jim, I've been to Korea on a number of occasions, of course, over the last 15 or so years. Uh, as I said, the Georgia Department of Economic Development has had a base in, in Seoul for many, many, many years, certainly preceding my, my role in the department and has been extraordinarily effective uh, on behalf of our state. Um, I have so much enjoyed visiting uh, Korea, um, mm -hmm. all parts of Korea, including that wonderful island, um, Korea's Hawaii. Um, <laughs> it's just a, a beautiful place. Um, how many times have you been to Georgia? I must have gone to Georgia. Are you talking my life? Well, we certainly, I, I guess I, I ask it rhetorically almost because with all of this great information you have, I think it would be absolutely wonderful to have you come and visit us in Georgia. And it'd be an honor, you know, I've, I've been to, you know, Georgia many, many times. I used to be a big fan of uh, the Braves. I love all the Georgia teams from the Gators to, you know. Uh, whoa, 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 time out now. The Gators are Florida and we don't yeah. talk about that in Georgia. That's true, huh? Okay, we're, we're, we're not talking That's about true. That. We're, we're, then, you know, I, I remember having a very good meeting with Senator Isaacson. Yep. Uh, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, about the, the, the Kenda and Kia plan in uh, Georgia. I think yep. he's a big fan of, uh, you know, Korea as well. He definitely is a big fan, as we all are, Jim. Yeah. A big fan of our, of our great friends and allies in Korea. Mm -hmm. And we so much appreciate you joining us this morning. We've had so many good questions from our audience. Uh, this has just been an absolute delight for me. And uh, I certainly would hope that you would visit us in Georgia and we can create all kinds of programs for you to meet 
our business people and to encourage the continuing uh, growth of the Korean and Georgia and Southeastern United States relationship. And so I thank you for that. I thank you, Consul General Kim. And of course, Ambassador Shapiro, thank you for this great opportunity. Well, let me, let me thank both of you. Uh, Jim, this has been tremendous. I don't think we've had a 45 minutes with as much really usable information about how to do business as this, this. And actually, this has made me think we need to do, you're the first AmCham CEO that, that we've done a program with and that that might make a, a nice series is doing programs with AmCham uh, CEOs around the world. This, this has just been great. I, I got to tell you, the kind of scares me, the idea of the CEO being personally responsible for anything the company does. Goodness gracious, that, that, that'll, that'll give you a pause. Um, <laughs> I, want, I, want to, I want to thank you very much for staying up late and doing this. Craig, uh, I want to thank you for getting up early and doing this. Craig's an hour ahead, pardon me, an hour behind us in Nashville. Um, Craig, you're, you're a great interviewer and I really, appreciate you brought out talk about great stuff that we all can use and of course thank you to Consul General Kim and the Consul General of Korea for sponsoring this program I want to urge all of you to please subscribe to the World Affairs Council of Atlanta's YouTube channel we'll post this program on the YouTube channel probably in an hour or two and you can also there see all of our previous programs that we've done so um Please do that. Uh, yesterday was Giving Tuesday. We've got to, I've got to do a little advertising for ourselves here. Um, we've got a, a, a program in place between now and the end of the year. Thanks to our board members, they will triple any donation you make to the World Affairs Council. So $25 becomes $75, $1,000 becomes $3,000. So Craig, Jim, Everybody who's listening to this, uh, Jennifer, um, think about making that contribution to World Affairs Council. Get a great return on investment. Next week, next Wednesday, we've got a program for members only um, with Her Royal Highness Princess Rima, who is the ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the United States. Her staff has insisted that we have to do this um, uh, off the record and members only. So this is a great time for, for members to join in uh, and join the World Affairs Council if you're not so that you can talk to Her Royal Highness Princess Rima. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining the program today. I wanna to give special thanks to June He from uh, AmCham Korea, who's been our counterpart for making all of this work, to Fernanda Lucchini, uh, our Executive Director of the World Affairs Council, and to Valerin Lopez de Frank, who is the producer of this program uh, and our business manager, uh, James Kim, CEO of AmCham Korea, James Lutt, pardon me, Craig Lesser, uh, founding partner of the Pendleton Group. Thank you both. And I wanna thank all of you for attending. Thanks. Thanks.